reading of God's Word. God's Word comes to us from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, starting with verse 25, to chapter 5, verse 2. Ephesians 4, 25 to 5, 2. Please give your undivided attention to the reading of God's holy and narrative and his infallible word. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that they may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the very word of our Lord here this morning. Please take your seats. We spent the last three weeks on essentially the same passage of Ephesians chapter 4 towards the end of chapter 4, and so we're going to conclude this section, and it's a good segue to move into chapter 5 starting with in two weeks. But this morning what I want to say is that what Paul has been trying to tell us is that he's saying we have a new life in Jesus, what I like to call a new creation, and he's telling us to live consistently with that reality. It's what I like to call a new creation ethic. You've been created anew, so live consistently with who you are. Paul has told us that in Jesus, we are made and transformed entirely into a new person. And that's why in verse 17, he tells us to not walk as the Gentiles do, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Don't walk like the world and the non-Christians and the non-believers because that's not how you learn Christ. So he gives us this commandment and says, put on your new selves in verse 24. And then he comes to chapter 4, verses 25 to 32, and then he explains to us exactly how to do that. And to be honest, when you look at this list of commands, there's really nothing new on surface level, is there? There doesn't seem to be actually anything really particularly distinctive in terms of a a Christian sense. There's nothing distinctly Christian here when you first look at it on surface level. Isn't that really the case? I mean, look at what Paul says here. Look at all the commands that he gives. Don't lie. Don't gossip. Speak the truth. Do not sin in your anger, don't steal, work hard and be kind to one another. No, is there is there really anything so distinctive about this? No, no, no non-Christian ethical system or religious system of thought would really disagree with this. I mean, you could find the same sort of advice in a fortune cookie or a Hallmark card. I mean, really, is there anyone or any system of thought or non-Christian system of belief that would disagree with any of the commandments that Paul has given us? It's almost as if he gives us a plain vanilla instruction on how to live the Christian life. But friends, there is really a world of difference here in what Paul is doing because all these commandments, all these commands that he gives us is not ultimately, he's not giving us good advice, but ultimately he's giving us good news that leads to the good advice, that empowers us for the good advice. He's not just suggesting on how to live a good life, he's giving us a savior that will transform your life. And that makes all the difference in the world. That's why this entire section is simply put Christian. Now look at the word Christian. You know, you have the word Christ in there, Christian. And so if you look at how the Bible uses this word, we see Christian first in Acts, but they add an adjectival ending, which really tells us that Christian implies an adherence or a belonging to Christ. And what Christ does and what he teaches, his person should shape your life. That's why we call it Christian. Christian. And so Paul ends on a positive note here this morning, and he gives us a summary of the Christian life in the verses that we have just read. And so I want to take a note of three points of the Christian life here this morning. Three notes of the Christian life to live consistently with who we are as new creature, new creatures and new creations in Jesus. So first, we're going to look at the fact that Paul tells us to put away sin. That's the first mark of a Christian, put away sin. Put it all away is what he says. And secondly, we're going to look at forgiveness, forgive one another. And then thirdly, we're going to look at an all-encompassing commandment, imitate God. 
So they're related here. He's trying to tell us, you want a summary of the Christian life, this new creation ethic? There's three things to keep in mind. Put away sin, forgive one another, and imitate God as children, as he is your father. So that's where we're headed here this morning. It won't be too deep. We're just going to give a high summary level view of what Paul is telling us to live consistently with who we are. And so we're going to begin here with put away sin. We see this clearly in verse 31. Paul says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Now Paul's statement is all-encompassing, it's comprehensive. He begins with, let all bitterness, all bitterness, comprehensive, all bitterness, and he ends with a generalizing statement, all malice, all bitterness, all malice. That's, it's all-encompassing. In other words, he's telling us sinful attitudes and actions need to be put away completely. They need to be rooted out completely from your lives because they do not, are not consistent with who you are in Jesus. Let all bitterness and all malice be put away from you. Peter O'Brien notes that this list is really just various forms and expressions of anger. You know, there's a logic, there's a progression of thought where Paul begins with inner attitudes, bitterness, wrath, anger, inner attitudes, inner emotions. And then that leads to outward actions of clamor and slander. So there's a logic, a progression from inner attitudes to outward expression. Clamor is really loud screaming and shouting in an argument. That's what bitterness and wrath lead to. Bitterness and wrath and anger also lead to slander. What's slander? Well, you could spend a lot of time here, but it's blaspheming God or really just talking bad about people behind their backs. That's really what it is. What's slander? Talking bad about people behind their backs. And so Paul has a logic, he says, take all the inner attitudes and the outward actions and put them away from you because they are not consistent with who you are in Jesus Christ. No matter what Paul is commanding us, put these attitudes and actions away. They don't reflect the new identity you have in Jesus. They don't promote unity in the church and the glory of, and the glory of God. Put them away completely. And my guess here this morning is that if anyone here takes a long, hard look at this verse, if you look at this carefully, you'll probably be able to relate to at least one of the items in this list. Now take a look very carefully at this verse, verse 31. You'll be able to resonate and it'll begin to feel a bit uncomfortable. One of the items on this list will begin to really speak to your heart. You can relate and look at this verse and say, I see myself in this verse. Let all bitterness be put away from you. Bitterness is resentful. Do you look around in your life and you think, I don't deserve this. I deserve something more. Do you look around in your life in the hardships and suffering and difficulty and say, that's not the way it's supposed to be. God shortchanged me. And if you feel that in your life, that means you maybe have a bitter heart. Bitter people fail to give thanks to God for blessings received, and they're quick to blame God for all hardships and trials. You know, is that the way that your relationship is? Are you bitter towards God? Bitter people, they take long lists of wrongs and sins. Bitter people have photographic memories of every sin that's been committed against them. That's bitter people. You never forget. You never forgive. Bitter people hold on to grudges through and through. They'll carry it to the finish line. That's bitter people. And Paul says there's a logic here. Bitterness can turn into wrath and anger. Bitterness can evolve into shouting matches and slander. You begin to resent people when they do well, and you have begin to find joy when people don't do so well in life. That's bitter people that leads to anger, wrath, clamor, and slander. And so if you look at this verse, in some way, you'll be able to see yourself in this verse. You'll begin to resonate and say, that actually describes me and my heart. That begins to describe the way that I think. You know, as a side note, I had a conversation with one of the brothers in this church, and it was just a random conversation. And it was about Joel Osteen and his book, Your Best Life Now. And I read the book. I wrote a paper on it for my ordination process. And you know, I didn't like the book particularly. You know, I don't pretend to judge Joel Osteen's heart or their church or their ministry. But the book itself, I didn't really like. Your Best Life Now. And I thought it, and I was telling this particular brother, that title actually is really depressing. I mean, it doesn't even make any sense. Your Best Life Now? I mean, I take a look at my life, and you know, I'm very thankful for the family and this church. But there's still sin. There's fallenness. You're telling me this is my best life now? This is all it is? No, I don't have a house. I don't have a car. I don't have any money. No, this is my best life now? You're telling me this is better than what heaven has in store for me? Isn't it my best life to come? I said, this, that's really dis disturbing, really depressing. And some of you may feel like that. You look around and say, no, is this it? Is this my life? Is this all that there is? All the debt that I have? All the relational fallout? 
dysfunctional parents and families? Is this really it? Is this all that life has to offer, offer to me in Jesus? And you begin to feel bitter. And then you begin to have wrath and anger. And then you begin to slander and to clamor. And Paul is saying that the Christian life means, the new life in Christ means, you uproot all of that from your life. You take it out. You now, if you're ever gardening, that's what he's saying. You take all the weeds out of your life. Uproot it out. Take it all out. And so when the question comes, how can I do this? If I feel bitter, I can't control my emotions. What can I do if I feel angry? It's an emotion. You know, some of the people watched Star Trek last night, and, you know, one of the main characters is Spock. You know, they're able to control their emotions. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm Vulcan. I, I feel like I can control my emotions. I would want to do that. But in reality, Paul commands us about emotions and attitudes, but we can't change our attitudes and emotions by ourselves. So how can we uproot this life if Paul is commanding us to do this, and that leads to point number two. He's saying you're able to do it once you understand that God in Christ has forgiven you and that you're able to forgive one another. See, in verse 32, Paul contrasts a life of bitterness and wrath and anger with a life of kindness and forgiveness. Verse 32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. You see, brothers and sisters, friends, the secret to not living a life of bitterness and living a life of wrath and anger, the secret to not living like that is to live a life of kindness and forgiveness, is to understand that kindness and forgiveness has been given to you already in Jesus. That's how you're able to not live as a bitter person. How can you control your attitudes and emotions and actions? Well, you can't. But when you embrace the kindness and forgiveness and the, that you have in Jesus, that's the secret to not living a life of bitterness. It's only when you realize that you have received kindness and forgiveness that you didn't deserve. It's only when you realize that this grace you have been given in Jesus you didn't deserve and that you are loved more than you can ever imagine. It's only when that saturates your life and that you've been freed from your sin. That's at the moment when you will be able to live out the commandment to no longer live with bitterness and anger. Once you realize that you have received grace and forgiveness in Jesus Christ, that's the only way that you're able to do this. Paul says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. God in Christ forgave you. He's giving us here, God in Christ forgave you. How do you live when, by putting away bitterness? Understand the love and grace you've received as God in Christ forgave you. Paul is telling us and he's giving us a paradigm but also a power. God in Christ forgave you. He's giving us a motivation but also a transformation as God in Christ forgave you. Forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. And when that saturates your heart and you embrace that, that's when you'll be able to live by the commandments that Paul says. The point is very simple. You'll forgive much when you know you've been forgiven much. You'll love people much when you know you've been loved by God much. See, those people who have a hard time loving, the reason is because they don't fully know the love they have in Jesus. Those people who have a hard time forgiving are really those people that don't fully know that they have been forgiven much in Jesus. That's really the correlation. If you don't understand the love and forgiveness of Christ, you won't be a loving and forgiving person. It's as simple as that. That's where the power comes from. If you're bitter, if you're bitter you hold grudges, it's because you don't understand your sin and the grace that has covered your sin. That's, it's as easy as that. If you don't know the love and forgiveness of Christ, you, don't, you will not be a loving and forgiving person. That's essentially what Paul is really saying. And so I want to take a, a slight detour here because I think it's important and I want to touch upon really what is forgiveness. Now if we're called to forgive and love one another and we can only do that as we understand the forgiveness we have in Christ, what really is forgiveness? I mean if there's any Christian notion of what a Christian should do, it should be love people and forgive them. Now what is forgiveness? If I ask you the question, what is forgiveness? You now many people respond and they say forgiveness is when you know, somebody messes me up and sins against me, but you know, I know I'm a good person and so I just wait until the emotional healing just goes away and then I, don't ever, I never bring it up again. But that's not really forgiveness. When the Bible describes forgiveness, surprisingly, it's not ultimately about emotions. When the Bible describes forgiveness, it is discussed in financial transactional terms. Isn't that interesting? What's forgiveness? This is what forgiveness is. It's a canceling of your debt. Now, if you have a lot of debt, you go to the bank, 
and just string all your debt together and they'll figure out, get out of debt program. That's forgiveness. It's a canceling of debt. That's why in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, what does the Lord tell us how to pray? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And in Matthew 18, really, this is a, a great parable on forgiveness. You know, Peter comes up to Jesus and says, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus says, no, 77 times. And you should give him over and over again. And then Jesus seeks to explain what he means, and he gives a parable. And so in Matthew 18, verse 23, Jesus says, therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. You know, this is forgiveness. How does Jesus describe forgiveness? Settling of accounts, a reconciliation, there's an accounting. And this is what forgiveness really means because in the parable, essentially what Jesus says is that this servant goes to this master, this servant owes and has a big debt of 10,000 talents, it's millions of dollars, and that this master out of pity and sorrow for this servant says, I forgive you, I wipe out your debt completely. You owe me 10,000 10, talents, millions of dollars, I, out of pity, I'm gonna wipe that out completely. And that's the essence of forgiveness. Because when people sin against you, they have incurred a debt. They owe you something. And forgiveness either means that you absorb it in yourself or you exact vengeance and you make that person pay the debt. No matter what, somebody has to pay the debt. You let, let your friend borrow your car and he crashes it into, into the wall. There's a $1,000 repair job on the fender. Somebody has to pay that $1,000. Either you have your friend pay it or you absorb it yourself. And when you absorb that $1,000, that's the idea of forgiveness. So there's a lot of transactions going on in this church. There's a lot of financial transactions going on in this church. A lot of debt is being incurred here. The question is, how are you paying that debt? Are you absorbing that debt yourself, or are you making that person pay you back? That's the essence of forgiveness. And Jesus, Paul, is telling us in the gospel, your infinite sin against an infinite God has been your infinite debt has been saturated and wiped clean by the infinite gospel capital. When you know that your sin has been completely washed away and the debt of you against the holy God has been wiped away, that is when the power of the gospel will saturate your life and you'll be able to forgive everyone else's debts. That's what you have in Jesus. Now, if you follow the markets, you may have heard this phrase, quantitative easing. easing. No, if that's what the government's really doing. I'm not trying to really put forth an economic view, but other countries do that as well. Japan says they're just going to keep pumping out money. It's like unlimited capital for our economy and our culture and our society. Unlimited capital, quantitative easing. So in some sense, that's what Paul is saying, but in a good way. He'll never stop easing that capital of the gospel into your life. He's pumping more and more of that grace into your life so that you could distribute it out to everyone and cancel everyone's debt. You yourself could be a Goldman Sachs, is what he's saying. You yourself can be J.P. Morgan. All this capital being pumped in by the gospel of grace so that you could cover everyone's sins that have been sinned against you. All the debts that have been given to you, you could wipe away clean because you know your record before God has been wiped away clean. But if you have not embraced the gospel of grace, you have not realized forgiveness and love, you can't live according to the way Paul is, and you will be bitter and angry, and you'll slander, and you'll clamor. Because Paul wants you to be so saturated in the love of God. He wants you to be so immersed in the love and forgiveness of Jesus that you will be empowered to live as you truly are in Christ. I think that's partly why we love fairy tales, isn't it? I was trying to think of a great fairy tale. Try, man, what's a great illustration for this? You know, Sophia the First, and Riley watches that all the time. I don't know if any of you have seen that. I was trying to come up with like, one of those illustrations where you know, you're somebody who doesn't think much of themselves, and they have Prince Charming who's perfect in every way, and says, I have all these people. I pick the one. I pick you. And then the princess is so overwhelmed and saying, out of everyone, you, you picked me? You chose me out of everyone? And then she's overwhelmed by that grace. She's overwhelmed by all that love. And Paul is trying to get that across to us. And one of the greatest illustrations that I've seen in a movie about this is, comes from this movie with Robin Williams called Fisher King. And you may have seen the movie, and you know, really pastors take this story and they use it all the time, but you have these two characters, Lydia and Perry, and Lydia is really one of those shy, introverted, low self-esteem people. And Perry is this one guy who has been following, you know, kind of creepy, following Lydia day in and day out, just watching her daily habits and activities. And they, he eventually falls in love with her, and they eventually go out on a date. And after the first date, at the conclusion of the date, Lydia says, okay, thanks a lot, 
goodbye, I'm never gonna see you again. And Robin Will and Perry's like, why? why would you do that? So they have this conversation, and I'm paraphrasing, but she's essentially saying that, you know, if you really get to know me, you're not gonna like me, you're not gonna call me, you're not gonna be persistent. You know, if you really get to know me, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna really love and appreciate me. And then Perry responds and says, I've been watching you every day. That's kind of creepy, but he says, I've been watching you every day. I know how many friends you have, I know where you work, I know everything about you, I know what frustrates you, I know what you're all about, but I love you anyways. To which Lydia responds and says, are you real? And she becomes transformed in that worldly relationship. See, that's what Paul is trying to get across. Jesus knows every sin that you have. He knows you're bitter, he knows you're angry, he knows you slander, you talk bad about people behind their backs, he knows that you really get into shouting matches, he knows all your sin. But even then, Paul is telling us, Jesus is saying to you, I love you perfectly. And that leads us to have a humble heart because he knows our sin. But then we have confidence because our identity is no longer in our sin, but in the love of Jesus. And that's the way it is with Christ. You are humble to know that Christ died for you, yet confident to know that you now stand in him. You would die for me? You would choose me? You would forgive me and my sins? That should overwhelm and saturate us. Perhaps the words of the old hymn by Trevor Francis captures it best. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast and measured, boundless free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over time. Underneath me, all around me, is the current of thy love, leading onward, leading homeward to thy glorious rest above. My prayer is that for myself and everyone, we would be able to sing that with truth and a spirit-filled heart to know that the love of Jesus saturates us. And that is why that leads us to point number three, in that Paul is saying that if you want to live the Christian life, uproot all the sin, forgive one another. But lastly, if he has to summarize everything, he says, imitate God as your father. That when you know that you've been saturated by the love of Christ, you will begin to love God and to imitate him. Paul concludes, and he summarizes this whole section by simply saying in verse 5, verse 1, Chapter 5, verse 1, be imitators of God as beloved children. See, how are we to imitate God? Not as a master, not as a, not as a slave. We imitate God as children. That's the relationship. He is our father. It's our relationship to God as children that we are to imitate him. You know, children imitate their parents. Can't you tell? When you look around, sometimes you can tell whose father that child is by the way they look, their family resemblance, but also how they live, for good or for bad. <laughs> You can see how children imitate their, their parents. Children imitate their parents. It's natural. It's innate. You know, I, I, I didn't think I was going to share this, but you know, I, at home, in the privacy of my home, I, I, I made up this little dance. I do this dance with Riley. Um, and so I just kind of play around and I dance, and you know, Riley begins to imitate. I don't have to tell her, Riley, dance like this. No, she just does that at the dinner table. She does that when we're playing around. She imitates my dance. No one come up to ask me what that dance looks like. I'm not telling you. <laughs> but that's what it, it's, it's innate. And, and Paul is saying, even back in chapter 1 and 2, you've been adopted into God's family. You are now his children. It should be natural that you imitate him. God is no longer your judge only, but now he is your father. And so we are to imitate him. See, the irony is that some of you are already great at trying to imitate God. You're great at imitating God. Why? You think you know it all. You're great at imitating God. You never think you do anything wrong. Well, you imitate God. You want everyone to worship you and to love you. You're great at imitating God. But that's not Paul's point. Paul's point is saying, yes, imitate God, but imitate God in his forgiveness, kindness, and love. That is how you will know and show your family resemblance. That you imitate God because God has forgiven you in Christ he says, imitate God, just as Jesus has loved us, we ought to love one another. The Jewish philosopher Philo once quoted Plato, and he urges readers to flee from earth to heaven. That's what Philo wrote, quoting Plato. Flee from earth to heaven. What is he saying there? He's saying essentially, become like God in holiness, in righteousness. Become like God in his love and forgiveness. Flee from earth to heaven. Be whisked away by the grace and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul ends once again with the model for this love. Jesus who loved us and gave himself up for us in verse 2 of chapter 5. This is how we are to live and be empowered. 
This is how we are to live consistently with who we are in Jesus. This is how we are to not walk as the Gentiles walk. How are we to uproot all bitterness and anger? How can we forgive and love one another? How can we imitate the Father when we look to the gospel and say that in Jesus, God has loved us. In Jesus, he gave himself up for us. And when they saturate your heart, that's when you'll be able to live consistently with who you are. When you embrace Jesus Christ as your Savior. See, the Christian, non-Christians in the world out there, and this is Paul's point when he says, do not walk like the Gentiles walk. The, the non-Christians in the world out there, they're not going to believe what we believe unless God opens it up to them. They won't believe what, they, what we believe, but they should li- want to live like the way we live. Do you see this? They may not believe what we believe, but they should look at our lives and our relationships, this community and this church, and they should say, I want that. That's the testimony of your lives. They may not believe the doctrines of the Christian faith. They can't articulate tulip. They don't know what ordo salutis means. They don't know what historia salutis means. It doesn't really matter. They they may not embrace the worldview that is undergirded by the Bible, but Paul's point here is clear. They may not believe what they believe, but they should look at us in our community and say, I want that peace that that person has. Oh, I I want that that joy that that person has. I want that ability to suffer well and to still serve people when life is hard. I want that. I want that humble confidence that brings a peace and prosperity. I want that brotherly love. They may not believe what we believe, but they should want to live like we live. Now, sometimes I think our church gets it the other way around, where we look at the world and we say, I want to live like that. But no, Paul is saying, do not walk like the Gentiles walk. They may not believe what you believe, but they should want to live like you live. That's what the Apostle Paul is trying to say. That is how the world should see us as God's children. That is how the world should see Christ's love as we love and forgive one another, as we build each other up with our words and with our actions and with our work and our generosity. And this is not possible unless you have received and embraced and been saturated with the grace of Jesus Christ. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast and measured, boundless, free. Please pray with me. Oh Lord, how can a perfect, infinite, holy God save a sinful, rebellion people like us? How can sinful, rebellious people like us come before a holy, righteous, omnipotent God? You tell us it's because of the work of Jesus Christ. You tell us it's because you have loved us and demonstrated that love supremely in the death of your very own Son. So Lord, I pray for each and every one of us that not only would we understand what the gospel means, but that we would embrace it with all our hearts in this union by faith in Jesus, that that would saturate our hearts, our souls, our minds, that would dictate and ground our identity and our value and self-worth, that would move us and motivate us and give the paradigm to become who we truly are in Jesus Christ. So Lord, I pray that this, this word, your word, may speak to us in that way. And we pray all this confidently yet humbly in the name of Jesus Christ.